so good evening everyone um, thank you so much for joining in today so today is the last day of our uh, three days master class on natural vedic case taking and prescription making and the past two days we have actually seen about what are the different concepts behind natural vedic case taking what need to be considered while we are um, going for <clears throat> taking a case okay so today um, we will be seeing about couple of um, systems where we will be how each system can be approached like i have shared a feedback form with all of you um, so i would request everyone to please fill the feedback form by the end of the day today already some of you have already started filling that and i have you have given certain suggestions that it would be nice if we can discuss something about the diseases how we will be managing the disease and i also have seen one specific feedback say that yeah these all are uh, these all are nice but uh, how we will be practically implementing this it will be really difficult to practice this in a, especially in the outpatient department um, it will be really difficult to practice and uh, make the patient to follow naturopathy from the beginning of course it is a very uh, difficult thing uh, because medical practice is difficult thing it is not that easy like we just prescribe something and uh, they get benefit and they going out so we need to be very strong in terms of our conviction as a naturopath and uh, how we can make the much needed change in the society and how we can help people get rid of the so called deadly diseases or the so called created diseases in front of us okay um okay so there is a question that uh, where we will get recorded session the recorded sessions are already mailed to your email ids um in the past two days we have mailed all the recordings like for yesterday and day before yesterday session Uh, please check your email ids uh, if you are not able to find it in your e inbox please check your spam folder uh, i'm just adding the email id from where you will be getting the emails just check your spam folders uh, for email from this particular email id which i have just shared in the uh, chat box and also if you are not received the e uh, emails uh, please connect me in whatsapp i can share it through the whatsapp as well and the certificates for your participation also will be sent from the email id which i have mentioned over here um, please check it and if you are not receiving it please connect with me directly to uh, whatsapp okay so let us get started so today i am planning to discuss about three systems one is musculoskeletal system disorders another one is metabolic disorders and another one is uh, gynecological disorders hope we will come able to complete uh, these things by the end of the day um so based on the principles which we have discussed in the past two days how we will be looking into the system disorders when a patient is presenting uh, with a musculoskeletal disorder or the patient is presenting uh, with a gynecological disorders who is coming in front of you so because of the time limitation we will not be able to discuss most of the system even though i have many systems in my hand to discuss but uh, i i think we will just select these three systems uh, for the day uh, which are very common and in our clinical practice and uh, let us get it it's just i'll let me share the screen so first we will see about the musculoskeletal disorders uh, why i have selected musculoskeletal disorders in the first place is like this is one of the very common uh, practice common thing in our practice we treat a lot of musculoskeletal patients and uh, uh, the recurrence rate of uh, the diseases is very high again in this particular patients when they come to us uh they really get relieved of pain and they may come back after some days with the same pain or with a different pain or a kind of a different disease so this is uh, just because of the reason we are not uh, connecting uh, the dots um and yesterday also uh, dr salvi has given me advice i should not use the term you you when i am uh, addressing you guys so uh, i'm apology for uh, to everyone if you feel it offended it includes me as well okay so uh, when we treat uh, this musculoskeletal uh, disorders uh, basically what are the concepts we need to keep in our mind and what are the different types of musculoskeletal disorders we encounter every day so whenever we are in consultation uh, we have a certain kind of concept in our mind like these are the diseases which we will be able to treat and these are the diseases which we will not be able to treat so this is the common thing which we are having in our mind and we also have our preconceived notion that certain diseases take this much time to get treated certain diseases get this much time to get treated so these all are based on our textbook knowledge and for a fresher naturopath novice naturopath who is coming out uh, every knowledge what he has got is either from during the internship what he has seen uh, from different uh, hospitals or it may be from the textbook uh, knowledge what uh, he or she might have developed from uh, those kind of experiences so until unless you real time experience and apply your concepts and it is not necessary that we should be 
uh, kind of uh, very much scared about we do not have experience in treating this condition. All we need to stick to is to treat any kind of conditions, be it cancer, uh, be it hypertension, be it common musculoskeletal disorders or ob gyne disorder. For any kind of disorder, what we need to basically stick to is our basic concepts and how we are approaching. And also why we have discussed about Herring's law of cure yesterday. That is just because of the reason the cure starts from inside to out. The cure starts from top to bottom. It starts from the middle to the uh, peripheries. And all the patient will be experiencing the symptoms which he has got in the previous time. Those symptoms will be re-experienced by the patients before the patient get the final relief. And the sustainability of the treatment or the treatment effects depends upon what is the component or element of uh, philosophy which we are putting in a particular patient? So if you are saying a patient that um, uh, now you are doing this particular treatment, you are in our hospital and 10 days you are feeling very good relief, you need to go to home and practice these all things in order to get continuous relief. At that point of time, we are putting more weightage on the treatments and saying that, that these treatments are something which is going to be protective for you forever. And you cannot leave this treatment. You cannot leave the diet. You cannot leave the sun exposure. You cannot leave uh, uh, the exercises, what we are advising. It is true that he cannot leave, but we should not make the patient depend upon that. The ultimate aim of a naturopathy consultation or a case taking is to give freedom from disease, give independence from the disease and develop the self ability to cope, to improve the vitality level. So yesterday we have discussed about what is the vitality the kind of animated force within that particular person, the reservoir, which is there inside a particular person, how strong is that reservoir to cope up with that particular condition? So that is what we need to fill in in our patient's mind and send them back. So it is true for almost all the uh, systems of diseases which we are managing. So if you just look into, so all these uh, uh, paper which is presented to you today, this presentation entirely, it's an evidence-based approach and you can see Whatever I have been speaking is from some published literature from some leading uh, journals, which is given as a footnote for a future references. Okay, So if you see the musculoskeletal disorders per se, if you want to define, uh, it is a disorders of your back, your neck, any arthritic conditions, your soft tissue syndromes, which involves the tendons, the ligaments, the muscles, cartilages, uh, which makes the bulk of the musculoskeletal disorders. Anything related to this particular stuff is considered as musculoskeletal disorders. But based on the concept which we have discussed yesterday, it is not only about the ligaments, it is not only about the muscles, it is not only about the cartilages. These are present within a system which has a relationship with some other system which need to be considered while we are addressing these conditions. So it, it includes when it is affecting the joints, we call it as osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis and all this all already you know. When it is affecting the bone, we call it as penia, porosis and tumors, uh, fractures and all. Then uh, if it is affecting the muscles, we'll uh, go and say uh, sarcopenia or a degenerative syndrome. And we have the spine, which is back and neck pain and multiple body areas, which has different kinds of musculoskeletal manifestation, like SLE, which has a musculoskeletal manifestations also. So this is a general introduction of the musculoskeletal disorders, uh, which we commonly see in our clinical practice. And every uh, musculoskeletal disorder, which is mentioned over here, we basically treat them uh, using a kind of a reductionist approach. We just look into a single centric approach and just keep uh, either we are more overwhelming with the kind of pain relief treatments which we are giving or we are very overwhelmed with the kind of anti-inflammatory diet which we are producing, uh, which, we, which, are, uh, which our knowledge is basically centered around uh, the inflammation or the pain relief, which is a very temporary goal, which is a short-term goal. Uh, this is going to happen again and again until and unless we are going to address the root cause, which is a speciality of a naturopathy physician and the naturopathy systems person. So, uh, and also as a naturopathy physician, we should have a clear cut discrimination between what is linked to a mechanical failure, which is resulting in a musculoskeletal disorder, and what is being an emotional failure, which is resulting in a musculoskeletal disorder. And believe me, around 80% of the musculoskeletal disorders which we are presenting, if there is no mechanical cause, they are mostly related to some of the other emotions. And when I'm saying this, this is not just uh, which I'm saying based on what I have presented yesterday. This is based on pure research, uh, which you will be seeing in the subsequent slides. 
So when you just look into the mechanical causation of the uh, musculoskeletal disorder, it is due to the daily wear and tear activities of the body. It can be a trauma, excessive jerking movements, auto accidents, falls, fractures, sprains, dislocation, direct blows to the muscles, whichever is causing a mechanical injury to the organs and that developing a subsequent trauma or injury that can be considered as a mechanical, which needs some sort of uh, kind of a uh, to say, like we can have a major part of that management strategy should be um, conservative. Whereas when it comes to the rest part, like whichever is developed due to kind of an emotional strain or a postural strain. So those are basically uh, something which is linked to uh, the emotional uh, part of our, um, uh, our brain. So uh, just give me a moment. So the postural strain, repetitive movements, overuse of certain muscles, prolonged immobilization, these things basically uh, result in uh, different kinds of musculoskeletal disorder, which we see in very common practice. And when you, when you see this, you can also feel that uh, is, whether these kind of things can create musculoskeletal disorders or not. We need to basically understand the human body as a whole, the human as a whole, well, if at all we want to treat even the musculoskeletal disorder, where pain or stiffness is something which is predominantly seen in our patients. However, the pain and that stiffness or any kind of musculoskeletal symptoms which you are getting is uh, something because of some underlying cause which is present deep rooted in that particular uh, patient's body or mind. And let us see what are those things. And there are overwhelming amount of articles uh, which basically suggest about the postural display of image, emotions. Okay. So, and if you can see the paper which is published in Psychology Journal in 2017, it suggests that the bodily postures conveys the action tendencies associated with corresponding emotions. So imagine a person is uh, not comfortable in a particular moment, uh, not comfortable in a school, not comfortable uh, where he, she or he is uh, getting married and going. So these things basically conveys, uh, will be affecting their posture, knowingly or unknowingly. And if this particular emotion is a long-standing emotion, you are in the same fragile environment for years together. Your posture is going to change and the posture is going to create some sort of musculoskeletal disturbances in the person. For example, and all these things are basically from these papers, which is being discussed over here. If you think that some person is having fear of any reason, like fear of disease, fear of death, or fear of uh, vivas, fear of uh, teaching people. So if a person is having fear, the fear posture typically involves an avoidant protective physical response to an external referent. So this is from fear, we have developing a separate avoidance. So you will be either uh, straining your body, straining your muscles, you, you will be having certain kind of an adaptability for the emotion called fear. And the long standing fear will be inducing changes in the adaptability and fear itself will be inducing inflammation in the first place because emotions also trigger your adrenal channels. And also, the postural change is also accompanied by the inflammation along with the postural change. And if you see the anchor, anchor is associated with individual extending towards a referent becoming larger. So there is a stiffness when you are ang when you are having a lot of anger and frustration. All the muscles are stiffened and you are you are expressing it too much. And you are imagine you are angry for a period of long time. And over and above, if you are not able to express your anger or you are not able to express your fear for a longer time that is going to have typical and you can see most of the egoistic people they are egoistic but they are not able to express their ego at a particular point of occasion because every time we will not be dominant in a particular crowd there are people who are dominant more than us so when you are a junior as a fresher in the college you need to be scared from your seniors but when you become seniors you will become very dominant so for the one year you have suppressed your emotions and suddenly you become stronger and you are trying and uh, playing something against somebody. So every emotion is associated with a change in your uh, in your posture. So whenever a person is coming, like a person is coming with an osteoarthritis, a person is coming with a stiff low back, we need to understand more than giving a treatment just for the physical aspect of that particular person, there is a constant postural change which is associated with his or her emotions. And it is our job to find out what is that emotion. 
that emotion can be a shift in job cycle, emotion can be a shift in non-pleasant atmosphere to work, the emotion can be a shift in uh, non-cooperative uh, colleague, anything can be a reason for that particular person. Small, small triggers which triggers the emotion will be changing our poster. And there are very large literature which is available and this literature are not utilized by anyone just because of the reason uh, there is no money to be made from this literature. But naturopaths can make money as well as make people's life better by utilizing this kind of information in front of us. Moving forward, when you see more about this poster and emotion, again, this is published in another one journal called Psychosomatic Medicine. Emotions are manifested not in just what people are saying. It is not just about what people say to you and you develop some emotion. I'm saying something to you and you're worried about what I'm saying and you develop some emotions. But also perhaps even more significantly in what people are doing. Like you are doing for something for a longer time which you don't like. That is something uh, or you are like worrying about something which is like yesterday I had told about something like hypotension of a patient. The hypotension is linked to the death of her son. So if a person is brooding over a negative event for a longer time, the chances are that, that their back will become more arched, their head bowed down and their eyes always looking on the ground. And this is not very much visible in particular person unless you look your patient in such a way. How many of time we have looked our patients in such a way, like how they are sitting, like we are looking, we definitely look, we look for reflexes. We look for something related to the anatomical position of that particular person. Preferably if you are a very hot musculoskeletal practitioner, more inclined towards anatomy. Otherwise, we don't notice this kind of changes in our patient. And it is not only in musculoskeletal disorder, it is associated with all the conditions. So person who is brooding over this negative event will be having an arched back. That is why we get the lordosis in our lower back, which is resulting to the disc prolapse and subsequent PID or the subsequent changes in the person. So what is need to be changed? The arched back cannot be stretched by just a physiotherapy exercise, sit straight on your spine. This is what we say in our yoga, right? Like whenever we take yoga for common public, we always say when they are doing a pranayam, for example. So people, after some time, they'll be going and doing the pranayam like this. They'll be drooping. They'll be just arching their spine. And you give an instruction, they will be keeping the spine erect. Yes, keeping your spine erect is very important. But it is a temporary state of mind. Like whenever they get an instruction, they may be keeping a science right. But their emotion, which is continuously there in the body, and we do not know what is that emotion, what is that negative event, they tend to arch their spine. And it's a clear cut evidence which has been suggested over there. This is not something which is an assumption. It is actually seen from people. Embodiment of sadness and depressions of the gait patterns associated with dysphoric mood, that paper which is published uh, just in 2009. So this negative emotional states are associated with two body portions and associated with subsequent musculoskeletal disorders. And this is what is I tell us individual factor in each person. And it is not necessarily always it is a uh, it is a mental psychological condition. It is a kind of a character you are. How, what is a personality trait you are? How you are dealing with a particular condition? Some, for some person, everything, whatever you say, whether it is a positive news or a less negative news, they consider it as negative. So such kind of persons, when continuously something is happening to them, that will be leading to some st uh, state of uh, postural disability, which can lead to musculoskeletal disorder. So I am giving you hints for finding different individual factors in a particular patient when a patient is coming with musculoskeletal disorder. So it is not about your spine. It is not about your disc. It is not about your inflammatory markers. It is triggered by the individual factor in that particular patient. So these concepts are uh, individual factor or tools which I'm just presenting to you for look into your musculoskeletal patients. Moving ahead, if you see, uh, if you want to just make it more, this is another one paper published in Cognition and Emotion, which is Embodied Mood Relation, the Impact of Body Posture on Mood Recovery, Negative uh, Thoughts and Mood Cognition Recall. If you are suffering from paroxysm or some kind of grief, okay, so you are in a very sad state. Okay, so when you are very much confident about anything, you'll be sitting straight and you'll be very much receptive. You'll be looking into your audience in front of you and you'll be very much communicating to your eyes. But when we fall into some sort of grief or when we have some grief which is unexpressed or even expressed grief, we fall into a state of very low spirits. 
right? Like we have this kind of thing which is going inside. How much ever you try to express something, this this you can notice in your loud ones. Okay, in your patients, you may not be able to find this kind of stuff. Like if you are having a colleague, you uh, the colleague which you are working with every day, and or a person who is very much near and dear for you, who you are working with every day, or who are who you are seeing every day, the slight change in their mood can be caught by you guys. Like we can easily understand that there is something wrong with that person. This is because we are very much connected to each other. So there may be a change in their posture, the change in their facial expressions, change in the things which you see every day. So they are very low. How we will consider that person as a very low, the movement is very slow. They are not interested in things. So when we have this kind of grief or some kind of paroxysm in our mind, we will be having very low spirits. And we may be utterly cast down and dejected. We feel very dejected why this is happening to me. And the muscles become flaccid. The eyelids droop. You don't feel interested. You'll be looking like this. You'll be sitting like this, thinking if you are in a meeting, you'll be just looking at your colleague like this. You'll be sitting like this. And your head hangs, contracted chest, the lips, cheeks, and the lower jaw all sink downwards and they own weight. Everything is like falling down. You are in a very flaccid atmosphere. Imagine if that thing continues forever and ever, maybe six months, three months, 12 months, two years, this is going to create a, emo, a postural instability and that is going to lead a disease. And if you want to address that postural instability where the patient is coming to you with a diagnosis of a disc prolapse or the patient is coming to a diagnosis of osteoarthritis or a stiff back or a cervical um, spondylosis or spondylitis, you need to address the spirit of that particular person. And until and unless you address the spirit of that particular person, the root cause is not going to be removed and it is going to exist forever and ever. Moving forward, if you see the most important component in the prognosis of musculoskeletal disorders, whenever a person is coming with a musculoskeletal injury or a musculoskeletal disorder, the most predominant symptom, and the, uh, like you can go and Google about the kind of studies which is there from injustice and recovery from musculoskeletal disorders. I've kept you a couple of um, couple of papers over here for you to refer, and there are more papers referred in this piece, particular papers. The research has actually shown that the perception of injustice. So we, we feel injustice at many point of time, even like when, like if you're a student, for example, you study really well and your lecturer or your professor is not giving enough marks for you or you are you are not preferred somebody else is preferred over you even though you perform really well or you are being insulted in front of your classrooms uh, which you feel that uh, this is too much for you to handle as a student i'm saying this will be creating a state of injustice for us and this injustice is going to create a long-term impact in our musculoskeletal pain and the problems. That is why people generally feel certain kind of body pain. So recently I have been, uh, me and my colleague, uh, Dr. Karishma, we are writing a paper on hypothyroidism. So in that particular patient, which we are following for almost four years now, she felt a lot of muscle pain. She felt insomnia. She felt she was a hypothyroidism patient and she was not able to tolerate the levothyroxine, which is given to that particular patient. So the levothyroxin is the patient, the body, the metabolic markers, like the TSH levels are coming down to normal when she's under thyroxin. However, her emotional state is going into her, like she's getting mood swings, anger, suicidal thoughts, a lot of body pain, fatigue, not able to get up. And when we were discussing with that particular patient, what she was telling is like, I am feeling that because of this medication, I am getting all these symptoms. And whichever endocrinologist I'm meeting, they are again and again prescribing the same levothyroxine. They're not ready to stop that levothyroxine, which I do not want to have. And she herself stopped the levothyroxine and past four years, she is on a naturopathy prescription. Uh, she came as a telehealth patient and now she is a, a visiting, patients, uh, visiting patient in her inpatient department. And after that, now she is very much fine, even without the thyroxine, levothyroxine dose, her TSS levels are normal, her BMI is normal, uh, her moods has improved a lot, there is no body pain, from 81 kg she came to 60 kg over a period of four years, and she's consistently following the same with mind-body practices, which is being given by my fellow doctor. So I'm saying you cannot look into the metabolic normalcy for people. So just being a TSH normal is not going to create a change in the musculoskeletal pain. 
or the subsequent changes which is happening in the patient's mind and body. The injustice which she feels in that particular person, this is one instance, and you can explore this in many of your patients. There will be some element of injustice. It can be a violation of basic human rights. Even forcing you to get vaccinated is a violation of basic human rights. That can create a lot of, and that is why some people, when you get vaccinated, you get prolonged pain because you feel that this is something not appropriate for me. Or if you undergo certain thing which is you are not willing to undergo, at that point of time, you will feel more pain, musculoskeletal disorder, because it's a violation of basic human rights. Or transgression of status or rank. Somebody is forcing something on you where you are forced to do because you are in a lower rank compared to that particular person. Or equity norms and the world beliefs. People believe that the menstrual women should be kept out of the home. That happens in the rural India. So still people are not allowed to get into the home uh, if they are menstruating. And though we proudly say that we should protect our women. So the world belief, this injustice which is creating to someone. And it can be something like when you are delivering a baby, for example, um, in India, if you see basically, um, the woman has to take the major toll of the entire parenting, which is happening everywhere, including in your home, my home, everybody's home, right? The women are supposed to take care of the babies. Many women who are professionals, and if you see in BNYS also, around 80% of BNYS are female doctors. But the number of people who are practicing after their marriage or is very, very less. We have less conversion of female practitioners coming into practice because of the so-called world beliefs. They, lo they lose their career. They lose their identity as a professional. And they have to do so many things to something. And, which, and womenhood is very glorified. And they are succumbed to that pressure of glorification of motherhood and womenhood, which we'll be discussing in our gynecological and obstetric disorders. So this world belief, you feel that there is something injustice happened to us. And this injustice is something which is resulting. You are suffering unnecessarily as a result of another's action or the experience of irreparable loss giving rise to perception of injustice, something which you are not supposed to go through. The literature suggests that this kind of thing can, high level of perceived injustice can be a risk factor for problematic recovery from a musculoskeletal injury. So until and unless we reach to the deep root, what is that dimension of injustice to that particular person, we won't be able to manage uh, we won't be able to manage a musculoskeletal disorder. Moving ahead, the pain, the perception of pain, how much pain you are going through, how much pain I am going through, it is, it is a very subjective feeling. We do not have any markers for pain until and we only have the, uh, what to say, physical expression for pain. And that depends upon how much pain that person is going through. And pain is not just a feeling which you are uh, which you are actually going through at that point of time, pain is subjected to the hearsay evidence also, right? So if somebody is coming and uh, trying to put an injection to you, right? Before even you are tricked, you start feeling the pain of getting injection, right? This is because of the perception what we have about pain, uh, the injection. Similar thing with death. Why we are doing so many things, doing yoga, having diet, or our patients doing the same? This is just because that they do not want to go through pain. They do not want to go through the death, which is not perceivably there in front of them. But they assume that they are going to die or they are going to experience a lot of pain if they are not going through something like this. Okay. If you see a prospective cohort study, um, these all are not experimental studies. These are all from observational studies. That is very, very powerful study design compared to the experimental studies. Prospective cohort study has shown that the personality type influence the pain perception and prognosis in a particular patient. If you are having a depressed mental state, it is associated with a very high pain intensity. So we can see many women who will be saying um, what they have undergone during the normal delivery. Some people say that it was a transient experience. Of course, there was pain but they could get through it very easily. Some people are traumatized what they go through during the pregnancy. This both depending upon what is the kind of atmosphere or the environment that particular person is in. There is a preliminary evidence that suggests that development of anxiety disorder precedes the development of chronic pain symptoms. Before even getting pain symptoms, you will have some sort of anxiety. 
the anxiety disorder precedes this particular pain, whether it's low back pain, ankle pain, or any kind of pain in our body. Somatic hypervigilance, you are too much vigilant about your body. Attention to threatening stimulus, you are just waiting for when the new variant of COVID-19 will be coming, you can go for another one booster dose for yourself. Or protect yourself and or your entire family from a mishap, you are so much protective about certain things. Hate and startle reaction. Startle reaction like you are very much scared. Like when you go and do something like this to a person, the patient is, uh, the person is very much startled. Emotional numbness, which is like your suppressed emotions. Avoidance and dysregulation in the stress response are seen in post-traumatic stress disorder to chronic musculoskeletal pain. So nothing is an isolated event. None of the pain, none of the musculoskeletal disorder is an isolated event. Bone, muscle, tendon, cartilage, everything is linked to your emotions. Everything is linked to the individual factor precipitating to that particular condition. We need to be definitely addressing this individual factor. If at all, we want to provide. So this can be used in the pain clinics. If at all, you want to give better experiences about pain relief, we definitely have to go through this particular thing and understand that patient. And this makes you as a physician rather than being a therapist. If you want to become a physician, you should have your own ideology. You should have your own way of approaching things and which should be very, very true and which should be very much factual about this particular thing. And all these evidences which is present over here, these evidences are presented by conventional physicians, but for their own reasons. And if you just go through this particular references down here, one is from psychology, another one is from psychosomatic medicine, another one is from cognition and emotion. Another one is from Spinal Cord Disorder or Journal of Occupational Rehabilitation. Okay, so these particular thing, basically what it is, and another is from neuroscience. And one is from neurology, one is from um, your orthopedics, one is from psychology, another one is from psychiatry. Again, these evidences are brought out as a kind of a reductionist approach only. But we as a naturopath, we do not have a specific neurology department or an orthopedic department or a um, psychology department. We are unison. We are uniting all these departments together because body does not recognize this is orthopedic department's work, this is neurological department work. It is a kind of a wired channel inside the body. And we need to understand this if at all you want to provide the long-standing relief where the patient is independent of the condition. The patient is not getting recurring uh, effects of that particular thing again and again. In order to understand that, it is very much essential for understanding this particular thing. And now coming back to the conceptual way of that. In naturopathy, what kind of interventions we will be providing to our patients for musculoskeletal disorder? You think about anything, but I go with four kind of approach in our naturopathy treatment prescription making. My primary concern is all the eliminative channels need to be cleared. Your gut, that is your intestines, your skin, your lungs and your kidney, the four major eliminative channels in the body. This need to be cleared at the first place because this is something which is precursing to all the kind of diseases and disorders in our body. Okay, so the gut microbiota and their metabolics are associated with osteoporosis, osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Applying a mustard pack or giving a abdominal pack or a, a, hand, a hand pack, leg pack, whatever we are giving, that is not going to address what is there inside. That is why you see uh, in a traditional naturopathy practice, whenever a person is going, they will be just going with basic treatments. There are nothing more than that. You do not have jacuzzi, underwater massage, circular jet, and you do not have powder massages. All these things are not there in a traditional naturopathy hospitals. There's a hospital near Talegao, uh, uh, like uh, Dr. Arun Sharma's relative, somebody has started that hospital. I've seen that hospital once, Telegao is in Pune district, uh, Maharashtra. What they have in that particular hospital is just packs and sun exposure and food. Nothing else is there. No tub baths, uh, no massages. And another one hospital, uh, Pragriti Shakti, uh, which is headed by Dr. Sijit and some of the doctors are participating from the same hospital also. They also believe more into uh, going with to the basics rather than having overwhelming treatments over there. It is always sticking about the ba basics and sticking to the basics and treating the patients effectively. Consider removing the debris of toxemia and make all the four systems uh, overwhelmed with the functions. So the first thing you need to make sure is that 
your gut microbiota need to be preserved because gut microbiota is something which is going to preserve your blood brain barrier integrity whatever has to cross your blood brain barrier is will it will be decided by the gut microbes so we need to basically look after the gut microbes even if it is a musculoskeletal disorder per se for all disorders my approach is going to be very much basic it is going to be very much grounded to your four systems and all the treatments which you are providing which will be around this four systems the gut microbiome is responsible for the absorption of calcium the vitamin d maturation of the immune system production of hormones such as estrogen and androgens and it is also responsible for the disposal of inflammatory cytokines in the body gut microbiota when i am saying it is not just the gut microbiota is involved what you are thinking what you are eating what you are injecting how much uh, antibiotics we are making the patients take we should make the patient avoid antibiotics as much as they can to preserve the gut microbial integrity avoid the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs as much as they can so this can actually bring in the much needed change in the musculoskeletal disorder this is one component which we are basically looking into and this is published in current osteoporosis report in 2021 of late the modern medicine is also acknowledging of looking things together previously it is a hard practice of osteoporosis or it is a hard practices of something just related to a particular organ or a muscle or a particular disease but as of now journals are coming together the literature the world scientists are coming together to acknowledge that multiple systems are involved together this is a particular a uh, picture which we have taken from that same uh, paper which is published um, the gut microbiome a new corner in the musculoskeletal research it may be probably a new corner for the modern medicine but it is an old corner for all of us our people were giving enemas our people were pe putting people into water fasting uh, they were making the people to do mind body practices they were giving abdominal packs they were giving natural probiotics since beginning i remember in kerala where we where i am from we have the leftover rice we eat rice a lot so if you cook some rice in the night if it is leftover we add water into that and we keep it preserved for tomorrow in the next day morning our staple food and it is also associated with poverty uh, when our childhood is not like what we have today we have good amount of food but we are not able to eat all the food in front of us just because of the reason we are worried about obesity we are worried about musculoskeletal disorders we are worried about our looks we do not want extra fat in our face and chin so in kerala what we used in our childhood we used to have that overnight leftover food with water and curd and we will be adding onions the green chilies which is locally grown and we will be having that as a staple food in the morning and we do not know that is a probiotic for us that is why at that point of time the number of diseases were not overwhelming like this and we are not too much materialistic like this uh, in which we are going through now and even our patients so an unhealthy microbiome due to diet the supplements which you are doing over diet excess diet exercise lack of exercise the probiotics prebiotics antibiotics breastfeeding c section all these thing contributes to osteoarthritis rheumatoid arthritis and weak low muscle mass unhealthy microbiome can trigger everything it can impair the glucose intake it can impair the fiber protein synthesis inflammation and the immune system activation and can lead to all the diseases and where is this particular triggered it is triggered from the individual factor a food a person suddenly become allergic to certain food stuff is not because of that food has become very allergic to that person the gut has changed responding to such kind of food and that is over reacting to such kind of food and it is over reacting the overwhelming immune system reaction is because of the kind of a mood depression individual factor present in that particular patient which is suppressed for a long time and that is triggering all these responses and that is the basic thing and second system what we know is like the breath so there are two types of breathing one is called uh, emotional breathing another one is called metabolic breathing so this is also published you can google for that as i also i told about the same the variation in respiratory parameters can occur in normal population even in the absence of respiratory disorders okay all doctors we all are doctors how we are sitting and breathing um i don't know how you are sitting i cannot see your videos what is your posture right now somebody will be lying down like this and watching or somebody will be looking like this and watching droop state we are not straight and when we are not straight our breathing is not straight our breathing is not happening from the abdomen and we make people practice 
sectional breathing to utilize from the abdominal muscles, diaphragmatic breathing, and have the proper exchange of oxygen inside our body. And when that is not happening in our body, the arterial oxygenation, the vagal tone dominance, the sympathetic dominance will be very, very high, which is going to affect the proper antioxidant status of our particular body. There is no proper oxygenation, which leads to tissue hypoxia and can lead to both mental stress and the physical stress. This is a very simple physiology. We want to correct something in our patient, correct the lungs first. Every condition in front of you, the lungs should be the first thing which need to be corrected. Um, and the gut flora also, we have something called lung flora also, which is linked again. So the breath rate and the longevity is very much connected. We always know, we always give these examples in our public talks. How many of us make a patient do this controlled breathing? Make them advise that this is something you need to practice repeatedly and make us a habit of sitting erect and having the abdominal diaphragmatic breathing which is going to be responsible for improving the immune status as well as the clarity of thoughts and reducing the feeling of injustice, reducing the feeling of depression, anxiety, and all those things. If you are advising this for a longer time, that is going to be an impact. But again, the breath rate is associated with our emotion also. If you are too much scared or if you are too much worried, how will be our breathing rate? There will be bradycardia, there will be excess uh, amount of gasping breathing because you would be requiring more oxygen for the brain to function because you are not in a right state of mind. So when our patient is not in our right state of mind, the HRV functions will be affected and re research suggests, as you can see in the screen, refining the breathing technique can bring in a lot of change in the physical and mental stress activity of a particular patient. And this is one component which we need to repeatedly practice in all the conditions which is coming in front of us. We don't have to think about too many things in managing our patients. We have to be very basic to these four systems and then manage the other systems based on conservative approaches. We have a lot of treatment options you are aware about. And this will be, uh, this will be decreasing the morality, mortality in pathological states and longevity in general population. This is a published literature. That the journalist breathe in 2017, this got published. And then coming to the skin and joint health. We ignore skin or the patients ignore skin a lot. And it is like we do not find a connection other than vitamin D in the skin, right? More than that, there is no connection in our body or our patients do not think that it is very much essential for ourselves to expose to sun. See, these are a very difficult thing which we say exposing to sun, it is very difficult. Take a five days break for doing something, it is very difficult. But when they fall COVID, they can take rest for 14 days because they are scared to death. When they get a fracture, they can take rest for three months because doctor told not to immobilize, not to mobilize your uh, limbs. So we need to create that kind of importance of this particular thing. We are a country with a um, tropical country with abundant of sun exposure. All Indians are 93 percentage vitamin D deficient. Yeah, use of sunscreen is also like, especially Sujit, you are from Chennai, you might have been seeing the um, sun in Chennai is very, very hot. And we cannot recognize our own people. They put masks till here on both the hands, use all the sunscreen in our face uh, because just we want to look like, uh, uh, and the fairness is directly proportional to beauty. Darkness is in the, uh, directly proportional to ugliness. That is a common concept because of the uh, movies which we are seeing. All the heroines who are selected in movies are white and fair. And we want to become like them and create more diseases over here. The skin severity is modestly correlated with joint activity. We never consider skin. Like naturopaths, they say that we need to get sun exposure. But how many of you consistently we will be saying our patients to do that? Or how many patients are believing that the higher skin severity are two times more likely to have increased joint involvement? It is not just the just the skin or the vitamin D, all the or all the kind of uh, body organs like be it our liver, be it our kidneys, as you can see in this particular uh, image, every part, every organ from our intestines, from our liver, from our kidney, everything is dependent upon sun. Every function of our organs are dependent upon sun. The vitamin D synthesis, subsequent precursor of remaining actions in our body, be it inflammation, be it your mood. There are studies, people who are in Arctic region are more depressed compared to people who are in the, closer to the equator. The power of sun. 
and since we have shut down all the parks shut down all our outside movements during the covid 19 we had more amount of mortality or the second wave was more severe in the country because our people were not exposing to the sun in a normal way we are exposed to there are a lot of people marketing the vitamin d supplementation is it necessary uh, yes i am also a marketer of vitamin d supplementation uh, just because of the reason we have a vitamin d receptor vdr which is which is called as there is a resistance in vitamin d receptor so if you do not and our ancestors had a vitamin d level of 80 to 100 mg per deciliter and we consider our laboratory reports more than 20 or 25 i don't remember the laboratory report exactly i guess more than 20 or 30 we consider it as normal and people in the same report which is written more than 80 it is toxic there is nothing called hyper vitamin d uh, status 30 thank you dr abirani so we need to just consider about the importance of sun it is not just the vitamin d it is about the catholicidin which is a natural antibiotic present in the present from the sun dependent pathways which is going to protect you for our body if there is an infectious etiology and also uh, the best time of sun exposure is in the mid noon from 11 to 3 and again there is a controversy we say that morning sun exposure is good vitamin uh, uv rays will come and harm nothing in india we have a very good sun exposure between 11 to 3 because there is something called zenith angle we need perpendicular exposure of our sun to trigger the kind of pathways which is need, need to be triggered in our body okay again i'm not getting deviated from what we are doing but what we are trying and i'm doing my phd in fasting so my phd report suggests that fasting increases the vitamin d levels okay so this is showing that how the autophagy how the kind of reactions present within the body is coming and bringing back the normalcy in a particular person which they need to optimize their functions so skin and joint health is one of the important area we need to concentrate the point is the lung the skin uh, the gut the three major uh, eliminatory organs are covered and this is a basic which we need to stick and whatever treatments triggers this particular condition you know the better than me because you are a um, you are a practitioner more than me there are more experienced practitioners over here than me so treatments for this you can uh, mid noon sun do not cause a sun exposure especially there are different types of skin types and this is a this is a kind of a thing which is propagated just based on some association if you are too much white skin too much of white skin we are very do have why we are becoming white the less amount of melanocytes in the body when the melanocytes are less we are more prone to skin cancer when the melanocytes are more we are not more prone to skin cancer melanin secretion is very very important and protective in all the conditions okay for that we need to have proper circadian rhythms which is maintained that daylight day and night cycle should be proper have to have proper melanocyte secretion in the body and then the final eliminatory system is kidney and musculoskeletal disorder so when you have the kidney and musculoskeletal disorder the musculoskeletal disorders in patients with CKD are resulted from abnormal mineral metabolism and extraskeletal calcification. Individuals with CKD had various musculoskeletal manifestation and it is like chicken and egg uh, situation which is coming first. We cannot predict that this will lead to that or that will lead to this. Di obesity is a risk factor for diabetes or diabetes is a risk factor for obesity we cannot make out. People who are not obese also will get diabetes. People who are uh, non-diabetes also will be becoming obese. So there is no chicken and egg scenario over here. And we are not in a race to understand which comes first or which is the risk factor for what. Nothing is a risk factor for anything. It is an individual stuff. And when you say diabetic complications, for example, we always say diabetic complications. Diabetic complications is not something which is happening that nephropathy is happening after diabetes. Maybe the kidney is impaired for a longer time that your the indication is hyperglycemia. That is what you see in your iris. So individual with CKD, and this is a paper which is published in the International Journal of Nephro Nephrology and Neurovascular Disease just in 2021. The kind of evidences you see, people have now started associating between the link of different systems. So when we have this particular thing, um, Ayodhika Das Gupta, that kind of specificity we won't be able to go because we'll not be able to cover our thing. Probably I'll be happy to discuss on a specific separate thing. Okay. Do not ask me for prescriptions, please. This is just to give the concepts of prescription. And musculoskeletal disorders, any musculoskeletal disorder. 
So CKD is associated with musculoskeletal manifestation. Musculoskeletal manifestation can lead to your CKD also, vice versa. But the impaired eliminating organs are definitely the reason for the subsequent changes in the body. So this is the kind of uh, things which we get. For example, you are giving good diet to our patients. You are giving good exercise and yoga to the patient. We are giving good acupuncture to our patients. We are giving them whatever is best in naturopathy to our patients, but still they do not recover or still they are getting recurring effects. This is because the individual cause is not, uh, 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 not uh, what to say, eliminated. And whatever you do, you do enema to a person, still the constipation is not relieved. You give colon irrigation, still the constipation is not relieved. And the IBS is still persisting because the root cause is somewhere else, which we need to basically address. Um, there was one question about sun exposure in the mid -room. We feel giddiness. If you say sun exposure in mid it is not like that we are going to expose for uh, more than one hour. 10 to 15 minutes of sun exposure. Sun exposure means with minimum clothes. We are covering everything, just exposing our face. That is not sun exposure. All the major areas should be covered. There is something called, uh, I want you to refer to this. There is something called veritable sun exposure. Okay. I have just put it in the chat box. Veritable sun exposure is something which is suggesting that what is the amount of body surface area which is exposed to sun. The more the area for the body, major areas like trunks, your thighs, the more it is getting exposed, the more you are getting the benefit of the sun. Okay, so that is, uh, so giddiness we need to graduate because it is all about training our mind and body. We have this preconceived notion, first thing will become black because of sun, second thing will get drained or sunstroke because of the sun. This need to be slowly changed from the patient's mind and gradually the sun exposure need to be because See the generation wise change. Our ancestors were on the field. They were on the sun without shirts for longer time. And we have become more sun protective citizens. We are behaving with more sun protective behavior. That has lead to a lot of troubles into us. Okay, so the major organs need to be eliminated. So if you want to put a holistic causation uh, for musculoskeletal disorder. So this is how I teach my students about how holistically you can just approach a patient. You correct all the environmental factor, be it good diet, be good ergonomics, um, uh, the avoiding all the kind of things, all the therapies, whatever stress, anti-stress therapies, whatever you want to be, those are called environmental factors. This is unity of disease and unity of care. But in order to correct, if you want it to be effective, we need to address the individual factors, which can be injustice, regrets, worries, fear, personality traits. Yoga can change the personality if you are providing the real yoga then the changes in physiological factors will automatically occur if these two things are corrected in unison, which can correct the musculoskeletal disorders, which is in front of us. Okay. So that's all about musculoskeletal disorders. Okay. So let us take a break now. Um, and we will be meeting again uh, by 8.5. Okay. So I have two more systems to cover. Um, so what do you want to take first? You want to take... Uh, Metabolic disorders or gynecological and obstructive disorder? Because I do not know how far we will be able to cover the both. Um, okay, we will go with the majority of votes again. Don't give me alternate answers. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, I'll just sit and uh, count what is that. So we'll try to cover both. If you are ready to sit beyond nine, we can uh, cover metabolic also. We'll take gynecological disorders first uh, because uh, that is one of the major area where we need to basically look into. And after that, we will probably take metabolic disorders also. And if you are ready to sit beyond nine, I'll be happy to complete that as well. Okay. So let us take gynecological first, take a break and come back in five minutes. Thank you. So welcome back everyone. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of gyne requests and Dr. Abhirami has take a, taken a dig at me saying that is metabolic disorders not the part of gynecological disorders? Of course, I'm very happy you're a, you a changed naturopath already. Yes, metabolic disorders is a part of gynecology and gynecology is a part of musculoskeletal disorder. So for the doctor, we are, uh, in order to give that kind of confidence, it, it is also because of the, you are a senior to me and uh, you have that kind of experience understanding this better uh, but 
at the later like when i teach holistic medicine uh, in my in my college uh, to my people so uh, what i basically do over here is like we have divided our system our basically you know, the kind of uh, holistic prescription making into um, around 25 systems and disorders and i go and speak the same thing every day to my people on a different concepts like when you speak about musculoskeletal disorder i'll be again speaking you on your gut your uh, your skin your lungs and your kidneys and how it is important what is the individual factor and ultimately finally when you listen to my classes for um, all the systems you will find that it is on the same but uh, given in a different flavor okay and that is what is naturopathy all about and thanks for bringing in uh, that perspective again inside Uh, to this class, uh, Dr. Abhira. Okay, so now let us get into obstetrics and gynecological disorder. Um, again, uh, it is again a valid point what Dr. Abhira has brought in. Like, since we are teaching you in a different system-wise perspective, do not think that these are in isolation. The OBG can lead to a musculoskeletal disorder, and musculoskeletal can disorder some trauma in OB gyne also. It is about the perspective which you need to keep because the patients who come in front of you will not come with "I have a whole system disorder." They'll come with "I have uh, uterine bleeding," "I have fibroids," "I have uh, diabetes." So at that point of time, you as a naturopath, you are not shattered or you are not affected by the name of the diagnosis. That is a kind of perseverance. we need to develop as a natural path so let us get into obstetrics and gynecological disorders okay so to just give a background and there are many first years also i have seen some feedbacks saying that they are new to this particular system and so they are not able to correlate but you are in the best time in this particular master class go and ask your lecturers more to explain in a holistic way not in isolation okay so gynecological disorders are those things which affects Uh, organs the uterus ovaries and all the gynecological related external genitalia and the breasts of a woman and to um, take some names of the disorders it can be pcos it can be endometriosis the fibroids the adenomyosis and the benign gynecological conditions that affect women of reproductive age okay so they are also associated with dysfunctional uterine bleeding in terms of different kinds of uh, what to say Uh, different kinds of uh, uh, menstrual disorders and also kind of pelvic pain uh, pain fertility issues uh, psychological morbidity and comorbid cases are also found in such kind of cases okay so how to treat this particular condition so if you see the um, kind of uh, gynecological disorders which is prevalent around 4.5 percentage overall global disease burden represents the gynecological disorder it is more than malaria tuberculosis ischemic heart disease and maternal conditions most of our people like we work in i work in specifically i work in a women medical college where most of our people are having gynecological disorders they are having some sort of uh, and the absenteeism is very very high because of gynecological disorders so this is basically uh, we need to understand from where it is starting so yesterday i have asked about the point about uh what is your feeling about menstruation i asked you to uh, to my fellow colleagues over here so they have most of the responses were pain irritation suffering bleeding uterus is crying and all those things that's those were the kind of expressions what we got from our fellow female colleagues so the common symptoms as you all know there are bleeding between periods the urgency to urinate like a continence incontinence then abdominal vaginal bleeding a uh, bleeding even after the menopause and the pain and pressure in the pelvis itching foul smelling vagina increased vaginal discharge so these are the common things which we see uh, in gynecological disorders okay so what is the starting point of all these things okay so this is again published literature as you can see menstruation is a very traumatic and very negative ex uh, experience for most of the young girls from any part of india so when you when you got your menarche the first time Uh, a female student get her menar the way the mother or the kind of community is being protective about she becoming an adult or she becoming she attaining the reproductive age it is like very much impactful and it is often traumatic and very negative experience for the young girls in india so this is one something which is precipitating to all the other conditions like what dr rabidami has asked it is related to metabolic disorder because it is a starting point for your individual factor probably for the patient's individual factor 
many traditional beliefs the misconceptions the practices associated with menstruation makes the girls vulnerable to stress and depression as well as reproductive problems it is not the ovary has suddenly started behaving different it is not that uh, your uterus is suddenly the endometrial thickening thick uh, endometrium has becoming more thick it is not something which is happening over a period of time there is a recent youth survey which uh, reported that there is low treatment seeking among indian uh, girls who are between the age of 15 to 24 because of the factor like stigma shame and social iso uh, isolation associated with reproductive disorders or menstruation i think this is the base or base triggering point of the root cause for the mounting gynecological disorder because every one of us are being born with proper physiology or for proper functioning of our body later what we add to our particular uh, physiology is something which is burdening our mind burdening our different systems in the body because what we think what we look is actually going to uh, interfere with our eliminative systems that is what is seen in the iris again and again i'm promoting iris because iris becomes iris makes us less reductionist because iris does not give a name for a disease iris give the overall status of the uh, status of the body moving ahead if you see the reproductive timeline of a woman a woman is born with more than 400 to 500 uh, like kind of like thousands of oocytes but she he or he, she will be having only 400 to 500 X, which is actually getting ovulated over a period of time till she attained menopause. The number of oocytes declining, the women's menstrual cycle shortens, the infertility increases, and the menstrual irregularity begins uh, six to seven years even before the uh, menopause because of the change in the oocytes numbers in the body or the change in the anti mullerian hormone, which is responsible for these things in the body. And all these things, the changes in this particular thing is happening because how much about the individual factor is contributing to the change in this. It is like everyone is presumably nobody is having that kind of junk food every day. It is only very less percentage of people is having a lot of junk food or they may be having lack of exercise or they are not satisfied with their life. All these things basically contribute to the number of ovulation which is happening in a week. Okay, and moving ahead, what are the factors affecting the oocytes? Even as a small uh, uh, like fetus in the mother's womb, from there it starts how your oocytes are going to maturate. Okay, so the many factors influence the oocyte quality, including the maternal nutrition, the stress, the environmental exposure. Environmental exposure means when you are taken out from the C-section, you are exposed to antibiotics and uh, other sterilizers, and you are coming out. When we are exposed to the vaginal canal, we are exposed to a lot of vaginal microbes that add to the acquired immunity of the kid or the baby, which is infant, which is coming up. So this definitely counts on the menstrual history of that particular person. And the exposure like steroids, the intracellular com communication, the antral follicular counts and the follicular fluid composition in the body, these all basically contributes to how the oocytes functions are there going to be. And added to this more stress and stress is a factor which we just say that you are so much stressed. We do not understand stress. Stress is different for different people. What you understand about my stress and I understand about my stress is really different. And the sleep levels, low education status of the mothers. When the mother is having lower education status, the child is more traumatized. You can see there is an association psychological stress related for abnormal menstrual cycle pattern among adolescent girls, a case control study which is just published in 2020. That is saying that more stress, improper sleep levels, lower education status of the mother among school going adolescent girls are strongly associated with abnormal menstrual patterns with more symptoms during menstruation. How even the education factor in your family, the customary fashions in your family can affect the menstruation. This we need to address. So whenever a person is coming in front of us with any kind of gynae problems, we need to be definitely talking on their menarch we need to definitely talking on what is their feeling about menstruation, how they perceive about menstruation, what are the beliefs around their family about the menstruation, which need to be de-traumatized for bringing in the change in our patients. And also an abnormal daily rhythm, uh, because our circadian clocks are very, very important for the female reproductive system. Uh, which will be leading to polycystic ovarian syndrome, premature ovarian insufficiency, because the breaking of the time code 
for the female reproductive system is very very crucial and it is a very known fact if you are not able to sleep uh, properly the next day you won't be able to wake up and you can function properly this is going to continuously following again and again for the females we are overburdening our own body because of this particular causation so we need to correct that circadian rhythm this is another one treatment intervention and there is a huge amount of data available for how the circadian clock work with the hypothalamus pituitary gonadotrophin axis and it will be finding a looping movement with our circadian genes that is bimal 1 gene is which is responsible for the changes which is happening in our body it is a loop every day the body need to expose to proper dark and proper sun for that your suprachiasmatic nucleus will work properly and will be secreting the proper hypogonadotrophins which are necessary for stimulating all the pituitary hormones like luteinizing hormones tsh and all those hormones which are involved in the reproductive systems so it is very very important then you see this paper which is uh, which is again it's a recent paper which saying that circadian rhythms within female hypothalamus pituitary gonadotrophic axis from physiology to etiology how it has become from a normal physiology to an etiology so we need to take care of that these are the simple things which we need to correct in our patients when they are coming to us while we are treating a gynecological patients and then coming to the gut so we simply prescribe some kind of diet to our patients but why we should be prescribing diet is very important and whatever things which are influencing our gut microbiome is very very important in managing gynecological disorders so our prescription making should be centered around the gut because gut is one of the very very important phenomenon especially in female disorders it can lead to several pregnancy complications adverse pregnancy outcomes pcos endometriosis and even cancer the human microbiome affects every stage and level of female reproduction starting from because when we are born both male and females we do not have very diverse gut microbiome we will be having a very limited amount of gut microbiome in the body the gut microbiome diversity enriches based on the exposures based on whether we are having a vaginal delivery whether we are having the breastfed whether we are not given artificial infant feeding formulas whether we are allowed to play in the sun allowed to play in the mud allowed to play in the water whether we are getting recurrent infections whether we are taking less amount of antibiotics these all are included in the diversity of our gut microbiome anything which is prevented for anyone we are going to get more and more of c section more of female reproductive disorders that is going to create uh, uh, imbalance in the follicular oocyte maturation in the ovary fertilization and embryo mitigation implantation and even the whole pregnancy and the parturition is affected because of the gut is affected in every stage of the body the sex hormones levels have a potential relationship with the gut microbiota and this concept is newly called it is again published in 2021 in the journal called gut microbiomes you can see in your screen the impact of gut microbiota on reproductive and metabolic endocrine system the concept where the sex hormone and the gut microbiota is linked is called microgenodrome and estrogen which is one of the principal hormone which is protective and is one of the principal hormone in female reproductive system the entire activity of estrogens how much estrogen is available for the body to function whether you are getting a hirsutism whether we are getting a kind of a pcos all this particular thing is determined by whether we are having proper microorganisms in our gut to deconjugate our estrogens and give that to our body for function and the capability of the gut microbiota in metabolizing estrogens are called as estrobolome so this newer terms in 2021 it is very fascinating for all of us because this is a testimony for what our ancestral traditional naturopaths thought about the gut they do not had a non genomic sequencing to see the diversity of your gut microbes but they definitely had the vision of thinking that gut microbiomes are or the gut per se or your intestines per se is the seat of intelligence for the whole body and that is why all the naturopathy interventions are centered around having an enhanced gut health or enhanced digestive health which is directly proportional to a good gut health and gut is not just influenced by your food gut is influenced by your individual factors also what you think how you think that is what yesterday we have discussed about the flight or fight mechanisms what we have been discussing and then why this estrogen is something which is important for our body and we all know that but how microbes are important for 
making the estrogen from a conjugate form to their deconjugated form, which is uh, bioavailable for the body. There is something called microbially secreted beta glucuronidase, which is an enzyme, which is the end product of your gut microbiome, which the reduced beta -gluco gluconidase is directly proportional to decreased deconjugation of estrogen and phytoestrogen in the cir circulating active forms. That means you are having an impaired affection of our guts, impaired function of our reproduction. So the microbes, protecting the microbes are very, very important in the reproduction. The decrease in circulating estrogens alters the estrogen receptor activation, may lead to hypoestrogenic pathologies like obesity, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, and cognitive decline. This is a complications of PCOS we call and we see in our textbooks. But this is a chain reaction of impaired elimination of our gut and your musculoskeletal disorder and your cardiovascular disorder and your metabolic disorders. Everything is linked. Increased abundance of beta glucuronidase producing bacteria can lead to elevated levels of estrogens and drives diseases such as endometriosis and cancer. More amount of a specific bacteria and less amount of a specific microbe is a problem in our gut. So we need to have that in balance. So excess, you will get endometriosis, less you will be getting metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease. So the estrogen levels, having appropriate estrogen levels, again, I'm not coming to the numbers. I'm not worried about the normal estrogen levels, which is there in your laboratory reports. I'm worried about the appropriate optimal level of estrogen, which is needed for that particular female for coping up with her own problems is what we try and achieve in our, in our patients. Okay. So in addition, the estrogen levels also can lead to affect the states of diseases like PCOS, endometrial hyperplasia, and ultimately fertility. And when the gut microbiomes are properly uh, tuned, because the end product of gut microbiomes are short-chain fatty acid, lipid peroxidase, the bile acids, the BCAAs, all these things basically affects the other organs in our body. Like the adiposity depends upon what kind of, because obesity is a systemic inflammation. Inflammation starts from your leaky gut syndrome. When your gut is having too much leaking and too much toxins are entering, the permeability of your intestinal barriers are affected because there is a leaky gut syndrome, you will get excess adiposity and inflammation. The fatty liver kind of changes, which happens in our uh, females, especially during their, uh, if they're having an endometriosis and things like that, that is because of the gut microbial dysbiosis. And the changes in the brain, because brain is the area which requires a lot of uh, ATPs. That is why brain contains a lot of mitochondrium compared to the other parts of the body. Lot of mitochondrium means lot of ATP production. Lot of ATP production means lot of debris. If you do not have proper antioxidants supplied in the brain, that is leading to oxidative stress and subsequent reactions in the body and your muscles. That is why you have lean muscle mass and more fat mass when we are having you know, like gynecological disorders. So the seat of treatment is not available. And why the gut microbiome is changing? That is because of the individual cause, which we have discussed before. It is over here. Where, where is the starting point? It starts from here. The inflammation starts from the trauma. Inflammation starts from the experience associated with the traumas. And then subsequently, all these things will be changing in our body. And moving to the next organ of uh, reproduction, uh, what we say, the lungs and reproduction, whether the lung and reproduction is, is related. There is an association between impaired glucose regulation and decreased lung function has been described in non-diabetic population. The glucose regulation is not just impaired in diabetic population. It is seen in non-diabetic population as well. In a large cross-sectional study, which is again published in 2020, I see the dates of publications. These concepts are acknowledged by the different disciplines right now. But we have been doing this from longer time. 2020 is a testimony, but we have been treating, we are being very successful naturopaths, but only thing we were not able to provide sustainable results for our patient and eliminate this kind of things from our society. Oligomenorrhea is associated with increased prevalence of asthma symptoms and decreased FPC, force vital capacity of the lungs. Inferior lung function, and increased prevalence of asthma is also associated with early age puberty and PCOS. So if at all, early menarche is a problem because you will be getting an early menopause. Now people are getting menarche in the age of eight, 
the age of seven, which is very, very early. The number of ovulations they will be having will be very, very less. They'll, that is why they are ending up in um, abnormal uterine bleeding, endometriosis at the age of 35, 40. Around 30 percentage of women in India does not have uterus. Unnecessary hysterectomy removal. Do we have a moral responsibility in bringing a change in this? My own mother, she do not have an uterus. I was a kid when she was, uh, her uterus was removed. In the age of, I think, around 35, uh, her uterus was removed. Okay. So, this is something which we need to change. And she's having forgetfulness. She's having a lot of, uh, she's having diabetes. She's having a lot of traumas, disabilities, kind of neurological pain. So, I treat her basic uh, like organs, eliminative organs. I don't tell that you take this, you take that. We are sticking to very much the basics. Make her exposed to sun, uh, bringing her lung function proper, bringing her digestive function proper. So an impaired lung function is pre precursor to your endometrial function and your reproductive function. Because the first thing which affects with our emotion is our breath, how we breathe. When we breathe shallow, the functional capacity of lungs is going to reduce and that can lead to subsequent disorders. So that is why pranayamas need to be given to our patients. Yama niyamas need to be corrected first if at all a patient has to do good pranayama. Because if the yama niyama is not corrected, the emotions are not stable. He cannot sit in a stable portion. Stiram sugam asanam. He cannot sit. Then the pranayama cannot be also achieved because pranayama comes after the stability in your posture. Musculoskeletal disorder, you have seen about what is the meaning of a posture and an emotion. The emotion is corrected, your posture is corrected, your breathing is corrected. That is the Ashtanga Yoga. Okay. So then moving ahead and every kind of our uh, philosophies are interconnected with our clinical practice, with our prescription making. Lungs and menstruation. Large epidemiological studies has been suggesting that there is a big fluctuation in the menstrual cycle in female patients during the menstruation. Okay, Because there is a change in the estradiol and the post uh, progesterone levels during the uh, menstruation. And the gas transfer reaches the peak level in all women at the end of the luteal phase, the start of the menstruation. So healthy women, the cyclic changes in gas uh, transfer with asthma are due to changes in diffusion characteristics of alveolar capacity, capillary membrane. So each of the lung function is affected by means of the changes which we are basically uh, going through during menstruation. What do you feel like all our female faculties over here before you even get the menstruation, like your periods are nearing. The moment the periods are nearing, most of our students are panic. Most of our female friends are panic because there is a lot of trauma associated with that. And that is going to trigger good number of stress hormones in our body, trigger the gut microbia depletion. There is no beta glucuronidose, which is going to have less number of deconjugated estrogen in the blood. And then this is continuing for a longer time. And naturopathy always believes nothing comes overnight. We need to correct the lungs. We need to correct the uh, gut. We need to correct the individual factor that is the thoughts. Moving forward, the skin and endocrinology. There is something called dermatoendocrinology. It's a part of medicine which focuses on fascinating facets of disorders that occur due to the disturbance of regulatory mechanism of the skin. Again, this is a 2019 publication in Medical Hypothesis. It's a BMJ journal. Okay. The skin, when it is affected, it is going to affect the reproduction. We have seen in the last uh, uh, um, musculoskeletal disorder also, how the skin is functioning with your liver, in your kidney, and your other organs. And so much fascinating, PCOS is not only the female's disease, okay? There is something called male PCOS also. The males also acquire PCOS, right? The most common presentation in males is early onset of baldness which is called AGA. AGA is nothing but androgenetic alopecia. The common skin manifestation of reproductive disorders are hirsutism, acne, seborrheic dermatitis, androgenic alopecia. So when you are getting all these particular things, when we are getting a pimple or when you are getting some kind of dryness in the skin, that is showing that there is something is not right inside the body. So we not, do not have to immediately apply Multani Mati to the face or aloe vera to the face to clean the debris. We need to check the lungs and gut and the skin and the kidney and eliminate these organs with proper treatments, whichever we have to give. And when we say about we are giving yoga, 
yoga is not something which you are starting with directly you go for badha konasan directly you go for supta vajrasan it is not going to work or you go and meditate it is not going to work it will work only if you start from yamas if you start from niyamas continuously work on the person's individual factor that is what is called chitta vritti nirodha we need to cessate the modifications of mind the waves of the mind which we call as ecg waves the pcos has also been associated with acondysis nigricans pyoderma gangliosum acne separativa syndromes and striae xanthoma and psoriasis any persons with skin disease can later stage they can get a reproductive disorder or a reproductive disorder can lead to skin disorders also vice versa we are not here to make the correlation of which is occurring first but the eliminative systems need to be taken care and eliminative system is affected by your mental functions and chronic renal failure in women is frequently accompanied by endocrine disturbances leading to menstrual and infertility this may be the result of a defect in the regulation of gonadotropin and resulting in lower mid cycle estradiol peaks when there is a lower mid cycle estradiol peaks you get a menstruation like syndrome and the imbalance in your fsh lh ratio and high prolactin concentration when there is high prolactin it is a kind of a pseudo pregnancy like stage the chance of you becoming um, fertile is very very less when the prolactinemia condition is present so if you want to balance this none of the hormone replacement therapies can help this patient because it's a very transient atmosphere by using just hormones hormones are triggered by the internal mechanism why i am making that uh, predictions again and again for this particular thing because this is the basics we have learned too much and we are not able to apply that particular things what we need to do is like again and again stick to the basics the holistic causation for a gynecological disorders are the concepts about reproduction which is the individual factor the menstruation the traditional beliefs in a person the trauma the shame or any other factors associated added together with all the environmental factors like poor lifestyle poor diet poor circadian rhythms food binging habits the emotional instability all these things can lead to the physiological factor which we see in our ultrasonography or our blood sugar or our blood reports laboratory reports that can lead to different kinds of gynecological symptoms so if at all we as a naturopath want to address these names which is coming in front of us like vaginal infection pms fibroids the first step will be starting from the individual factor that is a root cause for any diseases as per unity of disease and unity of cure when we are addressing the root cause along with changing the environmental factor the physiological factor will be coming to a homeostasis and we will be no more having those symptoms or the names so we don't have to name or we don't have to be startled by the kind of condition we are getting be it endometriosis be it ovarian cancer be it ca of breast we can definitely manage that condition if you understand the wisdom of the body and if you understand the basics of holism that is not understood as by that is why we are scared to take all the end stage diseases we are not able to handle or we are not confident to take the end stage diseases because we do not understand if you see most of our practices will be either physiological factor centric or environmental factor centric or symptom centric we never get into uh, the holistic causation centric so this together bring in the change in our people okay so this all about the holistic causation of gynecological disorders so the management of these conditions basically the first one is identifying the vitality levels the state of toxemia and the vitality levels how much is the vital force remaining in that person what are the concepts and beliefs of that particular person alleviating the individual factors priming the eliminative channels by eliminative treatments eliminative treatment starts with yoga clearing the mind of the patient then it starts with your improving the gut it is not giving enema just giving enema it is also included enema but giving good probiotics in terms of diet good exercise to improve the eliminative channels improve the lung functions improve the kidney functions improve the skin function then conservative therapies which is necessary for the correction of the environmental factors active exercise diet control all these things which will be giving if there is any pain associated giving some pain relieving treatment and then providing the sustainable ther therapies like arogya raksha panchatantras the five principles which we need to be followed then giving 
preventing clinical atherogenesis not indulging in excessive drugs drugs means the medical medicines which people are taking that need to be avoided so these are the common and improving the individual factor in a particular person these are the common thing uh, which we need to basically follow while we are uh, practicing a person so how to improve kidney function kidney is a part of your body okay so proper elimination of kidney means proper urine exposure the body is getting enough amount of diuretics in the body your packs can improve your kidney function proper exposure to sun can improve your kidney function having a proper diet balanced diet can improve the kidney function there is nothing specific to the kidney uh, do not go ahead with the same kind of hanky let us not bring it again come to a reductionist approach let us bring it holistic none of the element is just for a particular organ or a particular receptor it is for the whole body because your kidney has to function if you have to digest properly your digestion has to function properly if you have to breathe properly if you want to breathe properly your emotion has to be in a stable state so whatever you give for one thing is going to complement the other function so that is how the kidney function is improved so bring back these kinds of thoughts again and again to your mind so that we won't be failing as a naturopath okay so then getting into obstetrical disorder i don't think so we'll be able to take up metabolic disorders today uh, but let us consider compare cover this uh, obstetrical condition because why i want to uh, take obstetrical condition for all of us is because our role as a naturopath starts from when a when a woman is attaining menarche then she is getting married then they are planning for a kid and during pregnancy during delivery then how the kid is being brought up and then the pediatrics everywhere our role is there so our role majorly starts from the pregnancy okay and pregnancy is treated as a medical condition as of now and we call a pregnant woman as a patient yes dr amran we will try and do let us see how much all are interested by the end of the day okay so and we see we call pregnant women as patients my patient came for yoga my pregnant patient came for yoga so the patient terminology used by the doctors and when you take pregnancy related care from a hospital you yourself consider you are as a patient and you being a doctor do not create that panic situation consider making pregnancy as a pathology we all do that together right like we just make that this is something which you need to do this is something which you do, should not do we make pregnancy very complicated so pregnancy can affect both the women and their fetus and there can be lot of disorders which we can see like we are getting pre eclampsia conditions there are a gestational diabetes uh, uh, tortured veins as in you get varicose veins and all these conditions we have seen in our uh, pregnancy state so managing pregnancy opportunity pre pregnancy counseling before even the conception we need to have that is a kind of rapport we should develop with our patient if a young woman is coming for treating her pcos make sure that she is going to be our uh, follower or she is going to be a self sustainable naturopath forever and optimization of the medical therapy what we are giving multidisciplinary care during pregnancy where we need to supplement where we should not supplement we should be knowing during pregnancy more supplement of iron can lead to anemia in pregnancy there are papers but it is not a part of this particular presentation and if you see the gestational diabetes is a result of epigenetic alterations which is around that particular pregnant woman which is also also going to affect the kid as well the maternal genes react to pregnant women's metabolic status via epigenetic mechanism epigenetics is nothing but the environmental influence on the genes somebody has added something in the feedback that you want to know about the genetic causation of a particular disease there is nothing called genetic causation of a particular disease when i am saying that the statement is very true your dna is not getting changed but your genes are getting changed by polymorphisms because of the influence from the environment what we perceive Uh, what kind of food we eat what kind of water we drink what kind of environment we are in we creates a metabolic memory for ourselves and our genes transcribes based on the changes in your endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria so when the maternal circulation is changed because of the epigenetic pressure there is an increased glucose level increased hdl level cholesterol level which is leading to change in the placental level 
methylation, that is DNA methylation is what is called transcription of your genes, which is going to affect the fetus as well, as well as the women. So where we need to put a screen is at the epigenetic mechanisms. How we can provide, epigenetics is very well controlled. How we can control our genes by providing a very conducive environment. That is why some people recover miraculously from cancer. It is not because of the drugs or the doctors. It is because of the environment the cells are in. Each cells enjoy that environment. If my eyes are not functioning well, my mind is not working well, my stomach is not working well because one cell affects the other cells. Okay. So the epigenetic adaptations can be changed in our person. So if you see, this paper is again published in 2020, see the kind of thought process getting changed. Genetics and epigenetics, the new insight of gestational diabetes mellitus. So during men, uh, like when a woman is pregnant, we feed them a lot or they feed them a lot or there is something called emotional eating. If they are not ready for the pregnancy or uh, they are at a particular point of stage, we, we lose the body structure and we, we were very much worried about our structure and we binge eating and emotional eating is very, very high. So the maternal obesity, elevated level of circulating lipids can change the mechanism in your placental circulation, which will be increasing the oxidative stress that can create epigenetic modifications that is like liquid accumulation in the tissues, nuclear receptor activations, altered gene expressions and oxidative stress. That can create different kinds of health outcomes even in the kid which is born through a gestational diabetic mother. So if at all we want to build a healthy nation, healthy world, we need to take care of our pregnant mothers. They are not patients, they need to have good epigenetic atmosphere so that their maternal nutrition is properly taken care of. Irrespective of you having a lot of supplements, you still be, will be anemic. The patients will be still be XY syndromes will be there. This is because the epigenetic factors are not proper for that person. That is the individual factor, the domestic violence and all those things which is associated with this particular epigenetics. Yes, Dr. Deepa Shukla, we will try. Okay, so what are these epigenetic factors for a pregnant woman? So if you see the fetal nutrition in utero on hypothalamus, center, so we have the hypothalamus as a seat of our satiety and the hunger center, right? So we all know this from our physiology days. When you are in utero, the adequate nutrition and there is something called undernutrition or overnutrition. If there is an adequate nutrition, whichever is adequate that particular person, there will be a balance between the satiety and hunger. We will be having a normal birth weight baby. When there is an undernutrition or overnutrition, there is an imbalance between the satiety and hunger. Because the so called memory cells will remember that this person is 75 kg and we need to maintain the 75 kg. When you come back to normal to 67 kg, we need to make our memory cells believe that the person is going to stay there for 67 kg. And then we will be having an obese or underweight. Uh, uh, underweight infant based on the nutrition level which you are providing to our persons. And nutrition is an epigenetic factor. How we are processing the nutrition inside the body, that is also again influenced by the epigenetic factor. Okay. And when you see the gut microbiomes, the, again, this is a recent publication you can see in 2020, which is published in Frontiers in Pharmacology. There are a huge amount of bacteriums which is present in our body which is responsible for different kinds of diseases we end up during pregnancy. The abundance or decreasing of that particular microorganisms can lead to intestinal permeability, that is leaky gut syndromes, anti-inflammations, microbial metabolites not getting metabolites properly, epigenetic modifications, which is happening inside the body, can lead to gestational diabetes, obesity, preeclampsia, digestive tract uh, problems, autoimmune conditions in that particular woman, as well as the fetus. Whatever is affecting the woman through the umbilical artery it is going to affect the uh, fetus as well. So the change need to be happening in enriching the gut microbes, having appropriate gut microbes. So our idea about gut microbes, I don't know how much we have an idea about gut microbes. There are many colonies of gut microbes in our body. Okay, so these colonies, if it is abundance, that will create some issues. If it is less, that will be creating some issues. We need to have more diverse 
uh, gut microbes in our body in order to prevent or protect from this particular condition. The diversity of gut microbes depends upon what is our epigenetics, what is the environment we are from, how, how is our mental plasticity to a particular condition. Based on this, our body will be giving a change. And if you see the recent paper published in 2022, the maternal fetal gut microbiota axis, not only the gut brain axis, there is something because the microbial transfer to the baby starts from the mothers. This is the role where we have, we have Dr. Harini, Dr. Swarna and all doing wonderful work in um, holistic pregnancy in Coimbatore in Tamil Nadu. Okay. So our role as a ob gyne practitioner is very, very high. And I told about 80% of BNYS doctors are females. And most of the ob gyne doctors are males. You have a substantial amount of contribution can be done as female doctors and also male doctors. I'm not making a gender discrimination over here. Every one of us have a substance. And if we can contribute in the gynae OB disorders, we can build a healthy nation very easily. The microbiomes in mother's milk and vagina are closely related to the colonization of microbiomes in early infants. Okay. So this particular, the physiological gestational gut microbiota composition will be transferred to the developing fetus through the vagina, breastfeeding, skin to skin transfer. If this is prevented at any point of time, like you are not breastfeeding, like we are not promoting vaginal delivery, we are not making the skin to skin contact of the mother uh, and the baby intact, we are going to affect the maternal fetal gut microbiome. And this is the reason for development of a lot of neurodevelopmental disorders, autism, uh, and all kind of childhood obesity, the brain can, blood cancers, which is on the high rise, the childhood obesity, all these things are linked to the improper maternal fetal gut microbiota transfer. And this is like when I teach pediatrics to my students, they'll ask, sir, because they have been listening for, to me for a long time, what is that individual factor in a kid? The kid, kid does not even recognize an emotion. There is no ego for a kid. So if your theory is true for the adults, how can a kid get a uh, emotion or kid get a disease? It is a valid question. The kid's brain is the mother's brain during the initial and the father's brain. The kid listens to everything through the gut, through the microbes, through the umbilical arteries. The parental anxiety, when you are scared, the kid will be crying. You can see small kids crying when the mother is being scolded by the father or vice versa. They do not understand what is happening. They understand there is something fragile thing which is happening. The first time you are exposed to too much of education, thanks to our education system, which is burdening our kids. The kind of past two years uh, locking inside the room, no milestone development. These are the individual factors in our kids we fail to recognize, which leads to pediatric disorders. Moving ahead. So the maternal commensal microbes or their products transferred through the placenta or postnatally during skin to skin transfer or uh, breastfeeding transfer determines what is the kind of gut microbiota present in our kids. It has a long lasting effect on offspring metabolism, immune system and the lower the risk of developing a range of disease in the later stage of life. Even the gynecological disorder, we have seen the oocytes quality is linked to the maternal nutrition and subsequent andral follicles present in the mother. So we need to be very, very much careful about or very much contributory in this particular area where we can holistically prescribe treatments to preserve the maternal nutrition. And I have, I have heard from my uh, mentor, Dr. Babu Joseph and Dr. Satyalakshmi who is the director of NIN. There are maternal wards once upon a time in Gandhi Medical College, Hyderabad. People come to Natural Body Hospital, deliver their baby, take their kids out without any support. And now we are most as a remote physician to our giving yoga, that to asana pranayama, butterfly stretch to our patients or the so-called pregnant patients. And we are not contributing enough in bringing a healthy society. The role of a doctor, a Natural Body doctor in bringing a healthy society is very, very high. So our prescription making should be influenced by these factors. I'm not making any specific treatment prescription over here just because of a reason. I do not want to interfere in the prescription skills of you, but your prescriptions should be influenced by what we are doing over here. Increasing sunlight during the gestation period reduce the incidence of lower birth weight. 
prenatal sun exposure can increase positive birth outcomes especially during the second trimester see the papers all are published in 2020 2021 one is from 2006 a robust association exists between available sunlight in the first trimester and reduction the risk of preterm birth the preterm birth is on rise all most of the patients are delivering by 8 months 7 months 9 months and autism is on rise neurodevelopmental delays are on rise this is because of inappropriate sun exposure to the pregnant women and if you see there was a winter cohort which is conducted in london the people who have most of their pregnancy during the winter had a higher chance of preterm birth so that is why traditionally even uh, like we have seen in movies and also the ancestors used to say you should plan for your child the kind of uh, timing you should plan for a child should be somewhere uh, which is having maximum spring and summer seasons the more you are delivering or your pregnancy is covered during the winter season the more association is there with preterm birth and deliveries so that is the importance of sun exposure even during and we cannot prevent people getting pregnant during winter even during winter we should make sure that there should be appropriate sun exposure to our pregnant ladies so that we can avoid the low birth weight or preterm deliveries or related mishaps to our patients or our pregnant ladies and what is the individual factor that drives the change in a pregnant woman and if you see the fear of knowing or not being able to plan for that predictable many are not ready to be, become pregnant fear of harm or stress to the baby fear of inability to cope with the pain fear of harm to self in labor and postnatality fear of being done to fear of not having a voice in decision making many a times i have seen five kids six kids in a family i do not know it is a, a mutual consent process or it is a customary or even for a single kid it is not necessary that everyone should have a kid is that necessary it is a societal pressure on you is it necessary to get married is that a customary thing so i am married i should not say all this my wife is hearing this downstairs uh, but i am just saying this it is more of a societal pressure which you are taking uh, if you are graduated next marriage once you are married you have to have a kid once you have a kid then you need to work hard to bring the kids up and uh, send them to iit or um, lady herings medical college or st john's medical college and that is ultimate amount of life and then retire after having your term insurance for one crore you do not have a voice in decision making especially the females they are abandoned and alone they lose their job they are at home taking care of the kids wake up late in the night taking care of the kids fear about my body's ability to giving birth internal loss of control or terrified about birth and this is published in 2019 from a qualitative study taking about what are the fear of child birth this is going to have a very very heavy negative uh, impact on the psychological well being during pregnancy and the experience of birth this is why some women will become hostile towards their kids the violence during pregnancy or intimate partner violence has also received research attention that leads to consequences on the mental health and well being of the mother and her child and also motherhood is very glorified more than it is necessary and it is a indirect peer pressure on the pregnant women because you say that mother is the uh, something of above everything right and that is a pressure on you that is a pressure on the mother that i am so glorified i have to live to the expectation that shahrukh khan if you see he has given hit movies past 2 3 years he is not able to give a hit movie he is a superstar and there is a pressure on him being a superstar so being a super women mother could be glorified is also a, a kind of a pressure most of my female colleagues will agree to me i hope and the kind of nutrition the past psychiatric abuse sexual emotional or any kind of abuse intimate partner violence can lead to different kinds of modified pregnancy outcomes so if at all we want to make a plasticity in all these our role as a naturopath is very very high in pregnancy because it can lead to preterm low birth as well as low birth weight preterm delivery because postpartum blue moons i have seen in one of my colleague itself postpartum blue moons she lost her uh, father and her brother met with an accident during the pregnancy that had led to lot of emotional disturbances so this need to be balanced in a proper way 
and also even the postnatal psychological distress. The postnatal psychological distress uh, is correlated with previous abortions, previous loss of baby, unplanned pregnancy and absence of breastfeeding. If the woman is not breastfeeding also, that is going to lead some sort of psychological disturbances in the women. That is why the breastfeeding should be promoted for both the benefit of the women and the um, women and the baby. And this is our area. This is the area where we are going to start our clinical practice. We are going to make the change for the world. And economical and cultural variables are also associated with the pregnancy or postnatal psychological stress. Like being hungry in the past month, you are not getting feed enough. Being a homemaker, having unemployed and uneducated husband, spouse's history of having a psychiatric disorder, polygamy, domestic violence, dissatisfaction with the living conditions, lack of emotional support from the husbands and the in-laws. This is going to create a lot of imbalance in the pregnant women's gut, their lungs, their kidneys, their skin, which is leading, going to lead a kind of an array of disorders, both in the kid as well as the mother. So to end up this particular topic, be it a preconception or antenatal or postnatal care, we need to have a proper control over the epigenetics, which will be doing, taking care of their mental health. That is the individual factor, the diet, the sun exposure, the interpersonal relationship. And minimalizing the interventions like supplementation. My uh, wife delivered a normal kid in a normal delivery. So I was showing to one of my MBBS friends and I was managing most of the time in our hospital. Just uh, we were taking care with the support of one of my MBBS friend uh, in Pune. So she took a, this is a story to end up today's uh, session. Uh, and if you all are interested, we can take a break and continue with the um, metabolic disorders also. But let me continue com com cover this story. So um, during our eighth month, I was working in military hospital in Pune as a consultant. So we took an ultrasonography to see that if there is any uh, congenital abnormalities or something like it is there. So everything was fine. We took that report. She ca caught an indigo flight, went to her hometown for delivery. So and she was full uh, eight terms when she took a flight and went to her hometown. And uh, my father-in-law from their home, they took to another hospital for delivery and related procedures. So when she went to that new hospital, I'm not taking the name, it's one of the famous hospital in Trivandrum, Kerala. So she went there, they told that there, there is a uterine artery abnormality. Um, there is a stenosis in the uterine artery. And so that there is an intrauterine growth retardation which is happening to the baby. The baby need to be delivered immediately on the eighth month. So the entire family started, but my wife has become a converted naturopath by then. And we have been constantly working on this pregnancy together. Um, she was very adamant that I won't uh, consent for a preterm delivery. Uh, and she's telling that nothing doing. I can feel the movement of my baby. I do not want to continue with this particular treatment. The doctors were scaring her, saying that the baby will be dying. The baby will be dying if uh, the baby will be dying uh, because of your ignorance, uh, because uh, already the uterine stenosis has uh, reduced the amount of blood supply to that particular uh, baby, and she's going to die. So at that point of time, my wife took a stand that, no, I'm, I'm very much confident about my pregnancy. I can feel that the uh, baby is live and there is movement I can feel. And I've just taken my consultation. I've done everything enough and I'm very much prepared for a full-term delivery. So she took a discharge from that so-called big multi-specialty hospital and they have returned Lama, that is leaving against medical advice. Told her, if anything is happening, you will be responsible. The guilt has been already implanted. Then from there, she went to a normal hospital, which is not a so-called multi-speciality. They took, they admitted, they have done everything. By ninth month, 15 days, she delivered a full-term baby, three and a half kg with a normal delivery. If we are succumbing to that stress, if we are succumbing to this kind of uh, gimmicks, which is being created around us, we will fall on our face. And being a naturopath, this is the kind of perseverance you should bring in your patients, bring in your pregnant uh, ladies around you, to, with you, so that can create a real difference in terms of what is happening to the society on a large scale. We can prevent a lot of autistic kids, we can prevent a lot of postpartum blue moons, shattering uh, family lives, 
we can bring in a very very healthy society if we can concentrate on our uh, women's health okay so that's all uh, we have about gynae and ob disorders um, and i don't know how much energy is left for any all to uh, go for um, the metabolic disorders any doubts uh, in whatever we have covered till date anything you want to ask okay metabolic disorders okay and there is one question uh, when uh, yes sir metabolic disorders uh, i'll think if we can connect but it is going to be one and the same there is nothing much different from the approach the approach is going to be the same in metabolic disorders also take care of all the eliminatory channels take care of all the things which we are doing properly with all these things because we have covered a couple of things about metabolic disorders in pregnancy it is no difference between if it is a cancer or if it is a if it is epilepsy or if it is a pediatric disorder our approach is going to remain the same that will bring bring in a very good naturopathy practitioner inside you who can make better prescriptions who can take care of your patients from their individual factor and bring in the holistic change to our particular participants okay so with that uh <laughs> dr amre yeah let me see how many are ready uh this condition it discuss needs too much support otherwise female will be blamed for her condition okay i haven't uh, let me read uh what is it somebody has told no see family support is very much uh, uh very much uh, needed for uh, any condition because family is the environment that is what i am saying about the conducive environment do not isolate anything where the patient as a person is linked to be the diet the diet prescribed by the farmer the husband the mother the father in law mother in law the baby the studies the college the job everything is linked to a particular condition so if at all you want to make a change do i sound like a pseudo naturopath do i sound like i am i am speaking all science i am speaking the published literature i am speaking everything which is being published in a particular domain so okay yeah i will continue so those who want to leave you can leave and watch the recordings uh, i'll i'll continue with metabolic disorders and uh, okay there is a question do you believe in research modules published how much effect does it have an individual can lab values determine the effect so you should stay for metabolic disorders to understand this uh, there is something covered in metabolic disorders regarding the research which is being conducted okay so uh, what we will do we'll take a break for 5 minutes and uh, uh we will start by 9 10 okay let us take a break for 5 minutes and come back in 5 minutes and those who want to leave please you can leave and uh, you can watch the recordings later okay so welcome back uh, so we have 70 people left <clears throat> so let us continue with the metabolic disorders so again uh, as i told earlier metabolic disorders is also about understanding um, how basically we are just approaching a condition and how we can address the individual factor in a particular patient where we can give better clinical outcomes in a patient so it is not always about the elevated sugar levels or the kind what research projects are telling that blood sugar is dangerous blood pressure is dangerous it is not going to be related to that way okay so if you see um, in the last few decades there has been a significant increase in the incidence of metabolic disorders like there is a including disturbed glucose metabolism the abdominal obesity or the general obesity is being increased the blood pressure is being increasing in patients the dyslipidemias the insulin resistance hyperglycemia hyperuremia and these are considered as a kind of a risk factor for diabetes mellitus cardiovascular disease and stroke and we need to ask a question uh, to ourselves that whether we are in a right direction so we are like there is yoga in every hospitals there are good number of yoga practitioners across the globe there are ayurveda everywhere people are doing a lot of healthy there are a lot of gyms available people are doing the right thing again and again but what what is not happening is like we are not able to control these numbers it is escalating from back in 1990 it is 236 million now it is 460 million it is a 200 percentage 
growth in the number of diabetics or number of hypertensives or the different types of cancer. The breast CA has taken the first place from the lung CA. So there is a drastic shift in the kind of disorders what we are getting. And if you see uh, in metabolic disorders, when it is coming, even most of we as naturopaths also, we are most reductionist centric. We are either looking on an elevated triglycerides or an inflammation or a reduced HDL levels or an oxidative stress. We are more into small, small elements and we are trying to correct. When a diabetic patient is coming to us, what we are doing, we are trying to reduce the blood sugar level. When the blood sugar is reduced, we are happy. Patient is being treated with naturopathy. The same thing any drug can do with or without side effects. But can you say that confidently that the patient who are uh, treated with naturopathy, they are not going to get uh, a recurrence. They are not going to come with another disease. We are not able to say that. Then we are a failure as a naturopath. We need to definitely work on removing the clashas, removing the individual factor which is leading to the inflammation, which is leading to oxidative stress, which is leading to different kinds of stress uh, things in our body. And when I said about the laboratory parameters, somebody has asked about laboratory parameters also. Do we have to believe in laboratory parameters? On my opening remarks, I told on the first day that uh, this laboratory, we are treating the laboratory reports. We are not treating the patients. The patients with a lower TSH level, his hypothyroidism is healed or treated. But the patient is still having the symptoms. The patient is still having different kinds of anomalies and disturbances. Why that is not getting addressed? The patient is not completely doing well or the patient is not confident about doing well. Why that is not happening? The array of metabolic disorders, which is our forte, in fact, we get a lot of metabolic disorders patient to us. We are concentrating on these parameters, which we think that, which is going to prevent the associated diseases. It is not going to prevent the associated diseases. There are evidences available saying in the other way. Can abnormal blood parameters alone cause metabolic disorders? If you want to believe the research papers, which is, I am a researcher. Research doesn't mean that you need to believe everything is just been pushed to. You need to look, analyze, and understand what is happening. And if you see the two papers, which I have just presented over here, published in 2018 and 1936, to date, extensive research did not show evidence to support that the dietary cholesterol in the development of cardiovascular diseases. In fact, the 2015-2020 guidelines for Americans removed restricting dietary cholesterol to 300 milligram per day. We commonly in our prescription or in our talks, we say don't take fat rich food, don't take oily food, don't take cholesterol rich food, which is going to lead to cholesterol diseases. It is not true. It is not going to lead to cardiovascular diseases. Just consumption of dietary cholesterol is not going to lead to cardiovascular diseases. And there is no association between the total cholesterol level in the body and the degree of atherosclerosis. If total cholesterol should cause atherosclerosis, people with high cholesterol level should have more atherosclerosis than the people with lower cholesterol. Even in 1936 uh, kind of study, which has published that, the people with low total cholesterol were just same as atherosclerotic like a high total cholesterol people. It is a gym mix. Your cholesterol level is going more than 200, 250. You are worried and you are worrying the patients and you are scared to treat that patients or we are scared to treat that patients. No total cholesterol can lead exclusively as a risk factor to heart disease. This is again published literature. Moving ahead. LDL cholesterol, which you say that a high level of LDL cholesterol is more risk to myocardial infarction. And if you see LDL of patients with acute myocardial infarction, there is a large scale American study with 1,40,000 people who had suffered from acute myocardial infarction. When they came to the clinic, their LDL level was much low, normal than the actual LDL should be. If LDL lower LDL is protective, then they should not have got this particular uh, myocardial infarction. There is lack of an association between LDL and the degree of atherosclerosis. The atherosclerosis develops because of the kind of biopsychosocial pressure which is there on. And our plague starts from right from the age zero. By the age of 10, all of us has a small plague in our all arteries. 
there is a wear and tear response in our arteries and the heart is blessed with collaterals heart can form its own collaterals the more the stress the more the psychosocial pressure more the individual factor the amount of uh, cholesterol amount of the atherosclerotic ring will be increasing whether you have low td ldl or high ldl does not matter so ldl is not relevant moving ahead elderly if high ldl can cause atherosclerosis and cvd people with high ldl should have shorter life span than people with lower ldl levels but the cohort studies there are at least 19 cohort studies which is available which is conducted on 68000 elderly population it is suggesting the opposite way in this largest cohort study the highest people highest ldl levels people lived longer than the people who are on statins which is the cholesterol lowering drug and there are numerous japanese study and japanese people are one of the people who are having highest life span they have found ldl is not at all a risk factor for coronary heart diseases so this is a gimmick your total cholesterol level your dietary cholesterol level do not scare your patients just with ldl but ldl is high ldl is less hdl is less there is no point it is not at all protective it is about how we are processing i have given the example of puneet rajkumar who is fit and perfect died because of a massive cardiac arrest do you think his ldl level is very high or low it is not even relevant all is relevant is the holistic causation of a particular disease and moving up to the diabetes and we have good blood glucose level and low blood glucose level good hba1c low hba1c type 2 diabetes is a categorical error this is published in lancet in 2013 we set some threshold for hyperglycemia hyperglycemia is a normal physiological response there is nothing called high blood glucose or low blood glucose the diagnosis of a diabetes itself is a categorical error because of the hyperglycemia because we are not able to find a single centric solution or single centric cause for diabetes we we are settled down with harmful glucose level we are in a mental loop that insulin deficiency and insulin resistance is something which is giving rise to all these mishaps which is in the body in the reproductive disorders we have seen the gut the estrogen can lead to your metabolic disorder it is not the insulin the glucose which is going to glucose is something which is required for the body in any kind of flight or fight mechanism if our flight or fight mechanism is continuing to exist there is a need of lot of glucose that brain has to function so there is a, a philosopher karl wunderlich in 1850s 15 to 77 he lived he has taken what is happened to the medical system a view which takes abstract concepts as things we have taken diabetes is a multi dimensional disorder from that we have taken one component that is abstract concept from the entire etiological pathogenesis of diabetes and then we implied that that is something which is going to create actual problems and we are concentrating on that particular thing which is a logical blunder which has crept into the medicine and is flourishing there we even the so called holistic naturopaths are also succumbed to this kind of pressure this failure has reinforced by the introduction of one size fit for all guidelines just controlling the blood sugar blood cholesterol or uh, your weight is not going to be protective to any patient the patient will die if at all you want to make the patient live long a healthy quality of life we need to address the elephant in the room that is the individual factor that is very much specific to each person repeatedly saying a lie we are hearing this diabetes story from years together it is re reinforced our cognitive dissonance and ability to think we are in a reconcilable irreconcilable beliefs we are not able to get out of that feeling if i say this tonight tomorrow morning again you will take the laboratory report and sit in your clinic the compartmentalization of the brain of the functions of the body is the disaster happened to naturopath if you see the metabolic disorder is not just restricted to just the pancreas or liver it is related to all the particular organs which is involved in metabolism including your mind 
there are neuronal networks in the brain which coordinates with the entire body which is responsible for the food intake and energy expenditure inside the body okay this particular thing is controlled by your hypothalamic nucleus if you see this particular figure how much you eat how much we expenditure it, and how much it is deposited in different organs of the body it is decided by the arcuate nucleus which is present inside the hypothalamus the hypothalamus is very much sensitive to your perceptions if you see the further image over here on a normal person based on the stressors which is coming in front of you whether it is a physical stressor or a mental stressor or an environmental stressor it is going to affect the hypothalamus which is going to affect your adrenocortical uh, tropic hormones which leads to adrenal stimulation which can create this kind of changes even in normal person there will be increased neural excitability the cardiovascular activity will be increased there will be gluconeogenesis which happens the fat mobilization which occurs in a person the changes in the gastrointestinal tone and motility deferred immune status and behavioral changes all these collectively happens because of the perception level changes inside the body that can lead to different kinds of disorders which we address individually we separately treat all these disorders but the problem starts with the sensory nerve stimulation which triggers the entire cascade of reaction and this kind of reaction can be seen in the any metabolic disorder patient and what is the state of mind in which a person is taking the treatment also matters whether he is going to get beneficial effect of our treatment prescription or not so we have four major waves in our brain one is delta wave which is accompanied by a slow wave sleep non rapid eye movement sleep theta waves reflect a state of drowsiness which is most predominant in meditation also and most of the time our body is between alpha and beta waves alpha waves is most required for our persons to get better benefits out of our treatments when your alpha wave it means it reflects a relaxed state how many of us are in a relaxed state how many of our patients are in a relaxed state when they are taking x y therapies if you are prescribing therapies just to reduce the metabolic parameters or laboratory parameters we are trying for a metabolic normalcy we are not trying for a holistic normalcy holistic normalcy is the patient when they are in a reduced relaxed state at that point of time our treatment works better and uh, predominant alpha waves is expected to be there in all our patients and naturopathy can bring in predominant alpha waves by inducing the much needed relaxation by addressing the individual factor which is disturbing that particular patient which we need to identify based on your consultation and there are studies which reports what i have just told they report significantly lower level of alpha activity in diabetic children and adolescent with diabetes if the lower level of adal, uh, alpha waves it signifies that higher state of alertness there is excessive psychic behavior and there is also reported slowing down of alpha waves the alpha waves is reducing in the diabetic patients also in the non diabetic patients so if at all we want to address we need to induce the brain level changes in our patients that is a increased alpha levels need to be induced with our prescription making that is only possible when we reach to the roots and similarly if you see the lung and metabolic disorders metabolic disorders is a later onset of a compromised lungs metabolic unhealthy subjects were more prone to decreased lung function considered with their metabolic healthy counterparts if you are obese or if you are non obese there is a lung function impairment which precedes much before obesity and this lung function is more common in altered mental states like anger frustration extreme happiness extreme indulgence this will be leading to chronic personality maladjustment can lead to a lung disorder chronic exposure to job or marital dis dissatisfaction can perpetuate anger and physiological accompaniments associated with anger and frustration which you have enough addressed enough before and this can lead to susceptibility to various diseases because your lung function is compromised so the lung need to be addressed in the metabolic disorders very much and then about the inflammation so inflammation we all know it is one of the hallmark of our body which leads to different uh, tuber ruber paler caler and all and also it is a very short term adaptive response in our body to protect which is supposed to be protective if the inflammation is prolonging okay if the inflammation is prolonging something for longer time it leads to something called meta inflammation 
This is published recently in 2006 in Nature Journal. All the kind of diseases which you consider as a metabolic disorder, be it insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, atherosclerosis, these all are linked to other diseases and some kind of metabolic changes in our body. The meta-inflammation is nothing but the excess nutrients or lesser nutrients engage in a set of promoting metabolic inflammatory pathways in the body. That is why we call obesity as a low-grade chronic inflammation which leads to other diseases, a leaky gut. So even if you are obese or not, even your patients are obese or not, there can be a low-grade meta-inflammation which is always present in our patient, which we need to address, which is triggered by our uh, mental factors. And then we come to the chicken or egg question, which comes first, whether the inflammation comes first or the others. There is enough experimental evidence which suggests that inflammatory mediators can alone trigger whatever changes you want to happen in the body. And the inflammation is triggered by the flight or fight mechanism by any means. Inflammation is proximal to the metabolic deterioration. So we need to address the low grade inflammation first because you, you can be hyperglycemic, hypoglycemic, high hypocholesterolemic, hypercholesterolemic based on whatever condition you are in that particular moment. That addressing that alone is not going to work in a metabolic disorder. We need to just dig into deeper into that. To summit all these things, if you see, if there is a nutrient excess or deficiency, if there is stress or inflammation or infection or hypoxic kind of stage, that can create changes in your endoplasmic reticulum, which is responsible for transcription of our genes which is responsible for the epigenetic transcription of our genes, polymorphism of our genes, which we call as genetic disorder, but it starts from epigenetics. And the excessive mitochondrial involvement in our body, which can lead to different types of metabolic disorders. So if at all we want to treat the metabolic disorders, we need to address the individual factors we have seen in the other conditions also. The stress, the perception, the anger, informations, ideologies, when a person is diagnosed with cancer, when a person is diagnosed with diabetic, the notion of diabetic, the notion of cancer kill the patient faster than the disease alone. So all this environmental factor is kind of associated with what is, the, if you change your diet, if you change your, uh, uh, change your exercise pattern, if you change your wake sleep cycle, it is not going to improve the condition of the patient. They need to consistently do that along with the change in the individual factor. Then we can change the physiological factor and physiological factor is not a concern of any naturopath. You should not just treat the laboratory reports. You should be treating the patients with their individual factors so that you can address the metabolic factors which is present in that. So the management of metabolic disorders or the prescription making is based on understanding the toxemia levels and the vitality in our patients prescribing the eliminative therapies to eliminate all the, I have not included gut and all into this presentation because we have discussed enough about that. Giving good conservative therapies to prevent those immediate reaction which changes, pain, any kind of stiffness, disabilities and sustainable therapies as we have discussed in the last slide to bring in the much needed change in our participants. So that's all about uh, metabolic disorders. And I hope you all will try and make a change in the society uh, where we can bring in the proper naturopathic holistic practices among our patients and we can bring in a lot of laurels to the system of medicine we belong to and make that as a primary care system for the entire country and the world. Thank you so much for joining in with me for all these six hours, three days and I hope I could contribute something uh, to your life and your practice and please do uh, send in your feedbacks using that particular feedback forms. Um, and if anybody want to discuss anything or you want to say something, you can um, raise your hand or something. I can unmute yours. Or if you want to add any perspectives also, you are welcome. Okay. So it takes some time to things to sink in. Okay. Uh, because this is completely away from what we have thought we are. We thought glucose is going to be important in our life. Cholesterol is going to be important in your life. It is not. It is just, it is enforced to you. That is called facts. Facts always change over time. Once upon a time, we believed that 
diabetes is because of just glucose. Now we are believing that it is not just glucose, it is so many other components which is allowed. So these are facts which is being presented to you. Absolute truth is far away from the facts. Facts changes every day based on your experience. So let us move towards the absolute truth and do good to our patients and to ourselves. Thank you so much. Uh, have a nice day ahead and nice life ahead.